There we are. I was like, am I in the... I can preach in the dark. It's cool. <laughs> Good morning, Frontline Bible Church. I'll give that a sol solid 7 out of 10. Okay, some of y'all haven't had your coffee yet, and it shows. So uh, today we are continuing our series. For those of you who do not know, I am Will Hess. I'm a friend of Pastor John's. He, uh, he was a good friend to me during, we kind of became friends during uh, my pastorship at Door Baptist, and uh, he asked me to help him along with this series, which is super exciting because Genesis is by far my favorite book of the Bible. So I, when he said that, I was more than giddy. But you guys ever have a morning? Like a morning. You guys know what I'm saying? So this morning, I got a phone call from a neighbor that my dog was in the front yard. And I just hopped out of the shower. So of course, luckily our dog was obedient and came back, but I was like, oh my goodness, that was crazy. And then my daughter, after I'd gotten all spiffied up for you all, decided it'd be really cool if she just spat everything else back up on me. So that was exciting, and I'm over there trying to study for my sermon. So I'm just gonna say this, if this sermon's terrible, it's Eliana's fault, I am not above or below blaming a one-month-old. Um, actually, she's like three months, but anyway. So thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, real quick, I did want to say before we hop into the service that on the website, you will find some resources to watch to support last week's sermon. Pastor John spoke about abortion um, and the, bearing the image of God which is an extremely important thing during this time. My buddy Brian and I, uh, he's a deacon and a uh, and computer engineer and fellow theology nerd, we do a podcast called The Church Split where we talk about divisive issues. On the website, we have two links that you can go to under the watch, under the website, watch menu there. If you want some data in the description of the YouTube videos, you will find some resources that might be helpful if you have that conversation with people. On top of that, under the same thing up there, you will find two books that I've recommended for further reading if you want to know more about what I'm talking about today. I highly recommend On Guard by Dr. William Lane Craig. Cannot recommend that book enough. With that being said, all those introductions out of the way, let's get into it. So obviously we are talking from the beginning in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn all the way to the back of your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Um, that's an old pastor joke, okay? I couldn't help but crack it. I'm sorry. So Genesis chapter 1, beginning of your Bible for those who do not understand. So, or do not know. It's okay. I'm just messing with you. But I do want to say this morning real quick that we want to welcome you to a Frontline Bible Church, so our church here, if you're new. Those of you who are online, thank you for bearing with us. And what we welcome all of you, and I'm excited for today's sermon because this here is something that I am extremely passionate about. Those of you who watched my online services a while ago know that I'm really big into what's called apologetics, which is a, from the Greek word apologia, meaning to defend. I love defending the faith. It's, it's kind of a thing of mine, and which is why uh, I get to talk today about the first cause. So you might not know that you need to hear this today. If you're a Christian, you're here in church, you're probably going, of course God created everything. Well, no duh. But you do need to hear this. You need to hear this today because one, there's a lot of people who are told that believing in God is irrational. That if you believe in God, you've committed intellectual suicide, that you're an idiot and you just like good feelings. But that's not true. Believing in God is highly rational. Also, the other people that need to hear this today are those who might be struggling with doubts. Can God be real? See, 2018 and 2019 was a rough year for the faith, some of you might remember, because it seemed every single day somebody walked away from the faith. Do you guys remember that? We had Joshua Harris, the kiss dating goodbye guy. We had John Steingard with uh, um, Hawk Nelson. He walked away from the faith. Uh, you guys might know these big YouTubers and podcasters called Rhett and Link, they walked away from the faith. About four hours of them telling a story there that will break your heart. And then there's Marty Sampson with Hillsong. And they all ask similar things. Marty, he joined Hillsong at 16 years old. 16 years old, traveled the world, lived and breathed Christianity. And then he walked away with some of the most basic questions that would actually blow up your mind as a stable believer. So it's important that we have these conversations. What, this is what happens when your foundations crumble and you're not prepared for it. So we need to talk about how your foundation doesn't need to crumble. Your foundation is strong and it is there. So 
Today, I want to tell you that you can know God created the universe for the reasons I'm going to present to you today. And there are far more extensive things that we could talk about, but today we're just going to focus on a few arguments, okay? And those of you, and I do want to point this out. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, you don't have to turn there, but it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Greek word there in the Word is logos. It's where it means not just a word, but to speak out an idea. It's where we get the word logic from. So when we say that Jesus is the word, we're saying Jesus is the logos. It means that God brings order and structure to our minds as well. You cannot think, you cannot reason without God. And today, we, I want to emphasize the fact that we have, in our churches, intellectually been struggling. And it's because we, you know, we like the idea of a God who loves us, and we focus so much on some of those things, and that's good. But sometimes we forget the fact that there is a very real enemy out there trying to deceive the masses, that there is no God, that there is no retribution for sin, and that truly life is purposeless. So with all that out of the way, I want to talk to you guys about one of the most exciting things that you can know, which is God created the universe. So Genesis 1, verse 1. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This here just states the very beginning that God created the heavens and the earth. And of course, you guys are familiar with the entire creation account. And today, I'm not going to focus on all the debates in Christianity. Was it, is it old earth, new earth, young earth, theistic evolution, creationism, intelligent design? We're going to stay away from that today. That's a different discussion, because no matter what you believe, God had to do it. Fair? So, today we're going to discuss what is often called the Kalam cosmo cosmological argument. That's not good. I can't say it. Um, the Kalam cosmological argument. It comes from the medieval Islamic scholasticism, from which its ideas originated. It was popularized by the Christian apologist Dr. William Lane Craig, and especially in his book, entitled The Kalam Cosmological Argument. So, the argument's key underpinning idea is the metaphysical impossibility of actual infinities. Did I just lose you? In other words, it is impossible for infinities to exist in the material world, especially in the past. Uh, this came from the 11th century Persian Muslim uh, philosopher Al-Ghazali. And before you all go, is this guy Muslim and just trying to sneak in here? No. The thing is, remember we talked about a few weeks ago that God, all truth is God's truth? Just because a Muslim came up with structuring this doesn't mean that there's not some truth to it. And then what happens that Christians went, ooh, that's good, but it fits better in our worldview, and then they hijacked it. It was great. Um, so, uh, happens. So anyway, it goes like this. So today, the first cause, the Kalam cosmological argument, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Now, I'm going to structure this at the beginning like a standard formal argument, okay? So uh, what I mean by that is there, in every argument, there's a premise, a premise, and a conclusion that is supposed to build off the premises. But some arguments can just be bad, right? Like black bears are omnivores. Raccoons are omnivores. Therefore, black raccoons are omnivores. What? Like, see how that doesn't work? But at the same time, we can easily come to basic conclusions. You do this every day. And a lot of people, they find this kind of thing boring when you first talk about it. But we don't realize that we weigh arguments every single day. We make judgment calls based on premises, our basic beliefs, our thoughts, our feelings. All those things play into how we react with reality. Are we making sense? So, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Pretty scientific, right? The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. Not that complicated, right? And then the final conclusion is, God is the best explanation for a cause. So when we just look at this basic format, this merely gets you to theism, believing in God, but it's once you compare the resurrection and all these other things, the infallibility of Scripture and all the stuff puts together, it lands you really easily with Christianity. So, it is this very argument that gets us to know that God is not only real, but personable. See, 
uh, at the founding of our country, there was actually a large number of the people who brought in the Constitution that were considered what's called deists, which means that they believe God created the, made the creation, but walked away from it. It wasn't personable. But let me ask you, what creator is not personable with his creation? Everyone who creates something is connected to it. They loved it enough to create it, right? So for, to create something is always a personable interaction. So this is exactly what led up to actually last week's message. The idea that if God created you, you're special. It's personable. And now here we get to the very foundation of that. So let me take a few minutes of this sermon, because there's no other way to do this, because let's be honest, this is kind of a technical topic, but at the same time, it's important for us to understand. So let's address what atheists say, because Christianity is under fire a lot right now. So what are atheists' best arguments? Well, there's two major ones. And I'm going to do my favorite one first, which this one you don't hear as often, but I just think it's a funny one, which is the naturalistic theory of the universe has always existed. Turn to Isaiah 42, and we will get there in a minute. So the naturalistic theory that the universe has always existed. So therefore, we don't need God, right? If the universe is eternal, it's always existed, you don't need God. <laughs> it's a good way to get them out of the equation. But the problem is with this is that there are some serious logical impossibilities. And one of the most important things we can think of in Christianity, is, by the way, is philosophy and logic. Because God, remember, who is Jesus? He's the logos. He's the logic. He's the word spoken forward into taking order into chaos. So, Serious logical impossibilities arise. Either something came from nothing or it had to always exist. That's the idea. But the universe, they believe, has always existed. This gets us into what's called an infinitude. So if it's always existed, then there's an infinitude in reality. It means going on for infinity. So it goes like this. Actually, we're not going to get there yet. Hold on. So an infinite number of days has no end, right? An infinite number of days has no end. So, if the universe has always existed, then how did we get to today? Because that goes down forever. How do you even reach today? Today's the end of day of, in history, but if we're going backwards in time forever, then it makes no sense. So, let me try to help you with a picture image here. Today is the end of history, at least for today. So therefore, there's not an infinite number of days before today because we reach today. For those of you who are having a hard time understanding, imagine a hotel with an infinite number of rooms. So the hotel represents our universe, and the infinite number of rooms represents our days, okay? And then, let's say each room is filled. Someone, there's no vacancy. So now every day has events. That's the filled room. So then what ends up happening is that you go, well, today is today. Today is January, what, 23rd, 24th? Four, thanks. Not good with calendars. <laughs> talk about metaphysics, can't talk about calendars. But so here, we, so when you think about that, so, okay, we got to January 24th of 2021. Well, how do you get to that day? Well, it's an infinite number of rooms and they're all full. Well, what we do is we simply move one of the infinite rooms aside and we insert a new one. Does that make sense to you? If you're going, huh? That's because it's impossible. So you can't have an infinite number of days and reach today. The universe cannot be past infinite. It doesn't make sense. All the rooms are full and it goes forever. So you can never reach today. In other words, to put this is, can you count up to infinity? No. Can you count down to infinity? No. So therefore, we can't go back to infinity to reach today. So when we're thinking about this, when someone goes, well, I just think the universe has always existed, they have entered the realm of theology, <laughs> okay? Because only in theology can you make sense of infinitudes. Now, if the Big Bang occurred, don't shoot me. I know you say that in a church and that gets a little controversial. I'm only referring to the creation event when I say Big Bang. I'm just using what's used typically nowadays, okay? So whether you want to call it the creation event, whatever, I'm using the Big Bang occurred. I'll play on their playing field for a minute. If the Big Bang occurred, we'd expect to see ripples of such an event, would we not? 
I mean, you're talking about a giant explosion that created everything. I feel like there'd be some leftover evidence of that. Well, what's funny is that in 1989, some of you might remember this, there's this thing, the satellite called COBE. This guy, which is, COBE is short for Cosmic Background Explorer. It's a nice little satellite, and it was launched, and it found ripples of radiation left over from an accretion event. In 1992, I was one year old, just so everyone knows, you feel old. I, it makes me feel young, okay? I'm almost 30, so I'm having a midlife crisis. But, so in 1992, George Smoo announced what they found, and which was background microwave radiation. Ta-da! For those of you who do not know, that is radiation. <laughs> you're like, it's just a blob. To scientists, it's a big deal, okay? <laughs> for the rest of you normal people, you're like, okay. But there's all this. The universe, also they noticed, was expanding from a central point. Well, if it is expanding, it must mean it comes close to a particular spot, right? Which means, oh no, there was a beginning. For so long, atheists and scientists were just saying, oh, it must just be eternal. It's a past infinite. Well, now, not only is it logically impossible, it's scientifically proven wrong. Literally blew up in their face. <laughs> so, um, Smoot at NASA, this, this man who talked about this at NASA, he said it was, like, uh, it was like machining marks from the creation of the universe. Also, he said that it was like looking at God, and he also called it the fingerprints of the creator. Because, again, now they're having to come up with, how did it all begin? Robert Gastro said this, and it's one of my favorite quotes of all time, okay? This is a guy who was a skeptic, he wasn't a Christian, and this is what he said. For the scientist who had lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so it's one of my favorite moments because it, real, it makes us realize that the Big Bang Theory, as much as people try to use it to disprove God, proves him. Because, again, we're going to talk about their next way to try to dodge the obvious. And that's what this comes down to. I'm, I will never speak this candidly, by the way, when I'm witnessing to an atheist, but I'm hoping this is a friendly crowd. But this is when you realize the fact that we are, all we're doing is dodging the obvious. We have evidence of the beginning of the universe and one that was stretched out from a singular point, almost like an old book that has been labeled an antiquity once stated in Isaiah 42. So go to your antiquated book in Isaiah 42 that people say is outdated and can never be factual. Isaiah 42. And we're going to look at verse 5. Isaiah 42, verse 5. Notice this. Uh, by the way, I am reading out of the English Standard Bible, so for those of you who have different wording than me, I apologize. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and <clears throat> stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison who, those who sit in darkness. Notice how in the prophet Isaiah goes straight from creation to, from the creator of the universe to creation. It goes from this amazing guy. He stretched out the heavens. Good grief. I know I'm stretching out my pants as I get older, but I can't imagine stretching out heaven. Anyway, uh, but you think about this as stretching the heavens, as powerful event, then what is it, what, where does it go? From creation to the smaller creation. He says, who gives breath to people, and then what? He takes them by the hands and keeps them. It's a personable creator. We're created the image of God. Is it no wonder then why we're personable beings? If this amazing creation event took place and God created it for us, 
we're not even getting into the fine-tuning argument, how fine-tuned the universe is for us. That's called the teleological argument, and that's one I also have a good time with. But, uh, so, but then, of course, so, okay, the universe didn't always exist. All right, we accept the evidence. It, al- it never always exists. There's definitely a beginning. So, the only logical answer could be, apparently, was that the universe came from nothing. <laughs> See what I mean by dodging the obvious? Well, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it all it caused itself. Yeah, that's the best you have to ignore the obvious. So the universe came from nothing. I'm going to try to take this one seriously, but it is almost laughable. Because nothing can come from nothing. Okay? Nothing means no thing. Nihilo, ex nihilo, God created out of nothing. So nothing can create nothing. I mean, would you ever expect to walk into your garage and a Lamborghini pops up? That would be awesome, but it ain't going to happen, right? Would you ever expect to just, maybe you're a musician and suddenly you walk in and not only is there a fancy guitar, but suddenly you know how to play it? No. That's a, expecting nothing, something to come from nothing is expecting magic, okay? We're going to talk about that here more in a bit. In a minute. When we think of nothing, we oftentimes think of empty black space. Right? That's about as much nothing as we can think of. But it's not even that, because there's no black space even. It's literally nothing. There's no time. There's no space. There's no matter. There is no thing. And black deals with space. You see how irrational this already is? But we'll keep talking about it because it's fun. So, if someone is going to argue that the universe one day just began to exist, they put themselves on the side of the theologian of speculating how this could have happened. If it began to exist, as the argument went at the beginning, it must have a cause. Some people, uh, sometimes atheists, if you talk to them, you might run into this. I'm just going to throw this in here as a little tidbit. Sometimes they look at these subatomic particles, and if you're under a microscope and you're looking really closely, they'll see these subatomic particles come in and out of existence. And they go, aha, see, things can come out ex nihilo. But the problem is, it's just that it's so small, we can't invade it with our instruments without bothering whatever situation is going on there. In other words, just, we just don't have the means to investigate it. So at that point, they're being completely, uh, they're abusing science at that point. Okay, what we would oftentimes call an ad hoc, you know, they're just making something up to dodge the question. So, however, it is reasonable to believe that these aren't just flickering in and out of existence as much as we simply don't have the means to understand them. So anyway, back to this. So this is the skeptic's deliberate abuse of science, and many people will do this when you talk to them. And I am urging you, by the way, to learn to talk to people about this stuff. Learn to do it. If you don't know how to do it, I will give you resources, man. I'm excited about this sort of thing. They will twist whatever they have to fit their narrative. You know what we call that? The media. No, just kidding. We call that confirmation bias. Whenever you're shifting things to fit your own view. Think of it this way. If the magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat, at least you have the hat and the magician. Right? But in this situation, they're saying a the rabbit happened, there's no magician, there's no hat, just <laughs> And our world is far more complicated than just one rabbit. So to deny the universe has a cause is illogical. And it makes you basically a magic-believing atheist, which is a contradicting statement. So no one believes, as I mentioned, uh, a Ferrari. So if you were on a hike, just for fun, you were on a hike, you, got, you scaled this giant mountain, and at the top there was a, a Ferrari, or maybe a Bugatti, whatever, whatever car you want. You wouldn't go, wow, it's crazy how this mountain just created that Ferrari. No, you would go, huh, who put that Ferrari here? <laughs> how did they get it here? You start asking all the questions, and that's just basic human engineering. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of hardware, but it's still human engineering. It's not naturalistic at all. Or uh, I'm wearing, I purposely wore today, uh, a skeleton watch, a self-winding watch. Uh, there's a lot of p- parts to this. It's fascinating to watch, especially if you're like me and you have, I, you have the IQ of a potato. 
It's a lot of fun just to sit there and stare at and drool. It's awesome. Um, but also, this is a fine piece of hardware. This didn't create itself, and you and me are far more complicated than that, not including the earth, the ecosystems, the food chain, the various creatures that exist, and now we want to believe that it just happened. That is illogical, and it's impossible. As Maria says from The Sound of Music, nothing could come from nothing, nothing ever could. Right? So, Everything that is physical in the universe is governed by the physical laws, unless something outside of the physical laws tampers with it. And now I give to you the, ooh, hey, yeah, okay, who created God? Sorry, I was like, did I get mixed up? Did I get on a roll? The next thing here is who created God? That's the next question they're going to ask you. If you're having a conversation, they go, okay, well, if everything that exists has a cause, and who created God, right? How many of you have been asked that before? All right, my people. All right, some of you have had that annoying conversation. But that's why we have to be careful how we word things. Remember what I said at the beginning. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. God doesn't, never began to exist. He actually is eternal. Because notice that no matter what, you come down to an unmoved mover. You come down to an uncaused first cause, so to speak. In other words, something that existed forever. Sometimes atheists come up with like a multi-world theory. And the funny part about it is that even that eventually goes down to what world started first and it goes down to the same question. But what caused God? Well, God is eternal. Not, no, so again, the argument is very particular in that anything that begins to exist. If you go to Exodus 3.14, there's a very powerful statement. Exodus 3.14. And as one of those, like, if you're familiar with the story of Moses, this verse will be familiar with to you. When God revealed himself to Moses in the, in the bush, he says a powerful phrase. And it said, God said to Moses in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. Or in the King James, it'll say, I am that I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What he's saying is, I am the self-sustaining one. That is what the name Yahweh means. I am the self-sustaining one. And then, so when you say, well, God did it, and he's outside of time, space, and matter, they will naturally accuse you of God of the gaps. Well, you're just making stuff up. Whatever you don't understand, you insert God into. Have you ever heard that one before? Maybe. No? Yeah. And you can see why that would be a a standard accusation, right? Like, well, you just insert God when you can't explain it. But the thing is, is that we're not inserting God in what we don't understand. We're inserting God in what we do understand. We understand that anything that begins to exist has to have a cause. We understand that at one point in time, time, space, and matter all began to exist, which means in order for something to create time, space, and matter, or to cause it, it has to be outside of time, space, and matter. And the only thing that fits that definition is God. So, in other words, I'm not inserting God into a gap. I'm inserting God into what I know. Time, space, and matter can't cause itself, and it has a beginning. Only one thing is outside time, space, and matter. And to help you maybe understand this, some things exist by their very own nature. And when you go, okay, what do you mean? Something like a number. Numbers, are they tangible? Can you hold up the number 10? Maybe 10 fingers. But even then, that's 10 fingers, right? That's not actually the number 10. 10, the numbers, exist on their own. And people go, well, those are something we made up. Really? Because how come is it that numbers directly correlate with reality? Could rocket science do what they do without numbers? No. No. When you actually break it down, it's like, wow, it's weird that all these things directly correlate with reality. You are even thoughts right now. When you're down there thinking either this guy is boring as anything or you're falling asleep in here, those little thoughts in here where you're making fun of me right now, those aren't tangible. Some things exist by their own nature. Does that make sense? So why is it impossible for us to believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God outside of time, space, and matter? Is it not logical? 
based on the evidence? In the end, if someone wants to deny that anything begins to exist has a cause, if they want to be like, nope, nope, that's not true, or that the universe just began to exist on its own, they are scientifically in error, they are stepping into a fairy tale and showing that atheism to be philosophically bankrupt. It doesn't work. This is why I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, by the way. I just don't. I cannot believe in a self-creating, self-sustaining universe. DNA itself is information just jam-packed. Information has to come from somewhere. When was the last time you saw a self-programming computer? No. Someone like Bill Gates had to come along, right? So that brings me to the simple part, which is, in the beginning, God. Whatever created them must be outside of them, right? So we're going to move ahead, and we're going to talk about the attributes of God. So it must have been something outside time, space, and matter, right? We've already addressed that. Then we also know that he must be good because whoever created us created us with morals. Romans chapter 1, his law is written on our hearts. We know this. We know innately what is right and what is wrong. We might have a choice, but we know it. So we know he must be good because we feel guilt when we do bad. So that shows that we're made in his image. We also know he is personable because we're personable, right? People who aren't socialized very much become usually depressed and angsty, or they're just a teenager. Just kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> and he also must be extremely powerful in order to create all things. And you know what's funny about all these different definitions? Is that they just so happen to fit into what we know are the attributes of God. It's so funny that when we really look at reality, we really look at the science, and we go, God is the most logical answer. And then we look at the Bible, and we go, and the Bible explains all those things already. He is timeless. I have the references up here. You don't have to turn to them, but they are up here, but I will read. He is timeless. First Peter, I mean, Second Peter 3, 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You know what he's saying here? In the Greek, by the way, there's no more than a thousand, which is why he was using that as an idea. In other words, he's eternal. Psalms 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So he's timeless. He's outside of time. Which is why he's able to create, he's able to send a savior. He knows already. He's outside of time, space, and matter. He's looking at time. We look at time as this linear path, and he's looking at it as like he's keeping us in this little capsule. He's outside of it. He already knows everything that's happening within it. Okay? He is spaceless and immaterial. John 4 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit which means that he's not physical. Now, the word, that's what made John 1.1 1, 1 at the beginning is so powerful. The word became flesh. He stepped into time. Then we have power. God is all-powerful. Psalm 62.11, Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. He, enough, think about that. He owns power. He is power. He, and when we think power, we don't, we, you know, I'm not sure if you guys instantly think like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or something, but it is more powerful than that. Doctor Strange got nothing on the guy, okay? My fellow nerds, I heard you. <laughs> and finally, we know he had to create it. And the Bible says this. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. These are but a few verses that exemplify God's nature and how they actually correlate with what we know. This argument has books upon books upon books if you want to get deeper into it, but here's the thing. Philosoph here's the thing. Philosophy isn't a man-made construct because this is philosophical, right? I'm, I'm bringing scripture into the philosophy and showing you how they relate. But we have this idea sometimes that, oh, philosophy is just this man-made construct. I just want God. Well, no. God gave you a brain. Use it. 
Be deductive. Think. This is why Romans chapter 1 describes creation and as creation itself leaves people without excuse to know God. Because he's going, how else would have all this happened? <laughs> and it's funny, somebody had wrote that down over 2,000 years ago. And we're still, and we have all the skeptics today still going, hmm, I don't know, when the answer is so obvious. So the evidence points to a singular creation event of one infinite being. So therefore, let me just address this real quick. It, is, it can't be polytheism, because polytheism talks about multiple gods who have been created over time. But that's not what the evidence shows. The evidence shows a singular creation event of something outside time, space, and matter, which brings us only to monotheism, one God, which is Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Those are your options, <laughs> okay? Islam, let's just be real, is a joke historically speaking and morally, because Islam even denies the fact that Jesus died on the cross. You know what's funny is that that is like the utmost confirmed historical fact. We absolutely know Jesus died on the cross. In fact, people who didn't like Jesus recorded it. Okay? Like that is, so we know, okay, so we can't take that seriously, right? Then we go to Judaism, which is extremely true in many ways because this thing called the Old Testament we have, yeah, that's Judaic. But the problem is that then we, Christianity is built on it. And when you study history that fulfilled prophecy and all these things, one cannot avoid the truth of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this. All-powerful creator created you in the image of God. Let me ask you this. Have you saw a relationship with Jesus Christ? Understanding the fact that you are not a cosmic accident, you were created for a purpose. Have you sought a relationship with Jesus Christ? The timeless, immaterial, all-powerful God, also known as Hashem, which is the name, or Elohim, Jesus, Yeshua, whatever you want to call him, personally created all that is and that is to be so that we could live in it. And how cool is that? We talk about living in peace. He created it personally. He created us in his image so that we could be personable with each other and with him. In other words, God did all this so that we may know him and he may know us. How cool is that? You know, whenever you're having a really bad day, let's be honest, we all have one, I had a crazy morning. <laughs> you know the fact that God one day looked down and said, you know what, I need so-and-so in it. I need Will Hessen. Why does he need me? He loved me enough to create me. John 14, 6, by the way, said, I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know your creator? Get to know Jesus Christ. Do me a favor, and at the end of this service, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 17. This is, outside of Genesis being my favorite book of the Bible, I know y'all thought you were done with your books. I'm almost done. I swear I'll see people picking up like, oh man, I thought he was done rambling. Acts chapter 17 is such a powerful, powerful statement. Now, this is the chapter where Paul is trying to reason with the Jews. Okay, trying to tell them that Jesus is Messiah. And it says that he reasoned with them every day in the temple. So if you go to Acts chapter 17, he says this in verse 24. Verse 24. Definitely a really powerful area. Highlight it if you're into that. Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. God is knowable. God is understandable. And you can have a relationship with him. So today, I want to give you guys a weekly challenge. Some homework, so to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> take time to think about what things make more sense knowing that God created it? And by that, I don't mean just going, yeah, the universe. Think of the intricacies of things around you. 
Think of like just the food chain, just the way it works. Or the, uh, we bred dogs, Siberian Huskies. We bred them for a while, and I was fascinated with how God created instincts in creatures. Look at it and notice how things make more sense. Your morality, your guilt, your excitement, your joy in social activities. Look around you make, and realize how much more creation makes sense when you understand there's a creator. And the next part is pick someone to repeat the kalam to this week. If you know someone especially who's struggling with their faith, talk to them about this. And if you want to study more, there's endless materials, guys. We need an equipped church. We are frontline Bible church, which means we're on the front lines. Let's be on the front lines of giving that gospel. Give people that foundation under them and let them realize that being a Christian isn't irrational and, in fact, is the most rational thing you could do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this time you've given us to come here, Lord, fellowship with one another. And Lord, just thank you so much for your word and for creating us, for looking. And there are so many different creations you could have created, but God, you created us. We thank you for creating us in your image. We pray that we will live in thankfulness for your creation each and every day and that we will not forget you in it. We thank you for all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.